When you think of controversies in mixed martial arts, I bet a handful will always come to mind. TRT, the fall of pride, some event that ends in the word gate. But today we're going to ignore the ones that have stood the test of time and explore controversies that for one reason or another rarely got any attention after the initial outrage that prompted their scandalous status. I'm Tommy from MMA On Point, a massive thank you to our channel Hall of Famers, and these are 10 insane MMA controversies the internet swept under the rug. Number 10. Chael's 117 test fail. Given that it was just announced that the legendary first encounter between Anderson Silva and Chael Sonnen will be inducted into the UFC Hall of Fame this year, how fitting that we talk about the fact this fight was essentially null and void and everybody just pretends that is not the case. The only reason it's not a no contest officially is that Chael lost. He would have been stripped of the title immediately had Silva not landed that Hail Mary triangle. Hell, maybe not though. The UFC didn't take away the 50k fight of the night bonus after the fact, and of course we'll be honoring it and Chael in June. Following the epic bout, CSAC discovered that Sonnen had a testosterone to epitestosterone ratio more than four times what was allowed, strongly indicating PED use. To give some perspective, a normal TE ratio is 1 to 1. Chael's was 17 to 1. The American Gangster's subsequent year-long suspension was the reason he didn't get an immediate rematch and had to fight his way back to Silva, defeating both Brian Stan and Michael Bisping first. But seemingly nobody cares anymore, as this rarely gets brought up when discussing the legacy of that fight. People still look at it like, wow, when Anderson was at his peak, Sonnen was less than two minutes away from beating him, completely ignoring the fact that it never would have been counted. I guess it's true that bad times don't last, but bad guys do. Number 9. Venator FC Signs Mayhem By 2016, Jason Miller had become a bit of a pariah in the MMA space. This was after a long line of legal troubles, and the idea that anybody would ever put him in a fight again seemed absurd. But that is exactly what Italian promotion Venator FC intended to do. A move that was already controversial enough initially, but became even more so when days later Miller was again arrested for DUI. This prompted one of the funniest press releases in history, as Venator FC president Frank Miranda berated the media with such gems as, I would be personally curious to know how many of the Saints journalists and Miller's haters have never drunk a couple beers before leaving home. Seriously, do yourself a favor and look up the whole thing, it is amazing. The defiant promotion refused to cancel the bout, and then it blew up in their faces the most mayhem way possible, as Miller would miss weight by 24 pounds. <laughs> and be forced into a fight with a rando light heavyweight who defeated him via submission. Number 8. Foot Drop Fight The metagame of low calf kicks in high-level MMA has only really gained popularity in recent years, and our knowledge as a fandom of the strange phenomenon known as foot drop that can be caused by a well-placed calf kick is pretty recent too. So in 2015, when a low calf kick caused foot drop at the end of the first round of a fight between Scott Jorgensen and Alejandro Perez, fans were mortified that the fight was allowed to continue continue into the second round, as it appeared that Jorgensen had severely injured his foot, which was flopping every which way as he stumbled around. I too joined in that night on the anger over how it was handled, and while the referee caught flack, it was more so Scott's coach Kit Cope who could be heard on the broadcast encouraging Jorgensen to continue. That's nice. In hindsight, this controversy was massively overblown, as this was a do-or-die bout for Jorgensen in his career, the foot drop really wasn't that serious, and Cope was just trying to encourage his fighter as best he could in a bad situation. After falling down one too many times, Scott would finally tap out, and this would unfortunately be his last ever bout. Number 7. Reebok's Biggest Blunder Everybody remembers the hilariously bad launch of the UFC's Reebok sponsorship. The kits looked like they were Power Rangers outfits, the fighters' names were all wrong, but one aspect few seem to mention anymore, and where they really got into some hot water, was with a t-shirt design that nearly destroyed their relationship with the UFC by way of the promotion's biggest star. After launch, Reebok posted a shirt called UFC Ireland Map T with a caption that read, show your territorial allegiance, and excluded Northern Ireland from the image on the shirt. Now, I don't have the qualifications to begin to explain the troubles in any level of depth, but suffice to say that it was a controversial design in 
Ireland, and led to Conor McGregor's coach John Kavanaugh saying in a now-deleted tweet that if the design was not changed, none of his fighters would be associated with Reebok. The brand quickly apologized, removed the offensive shirt, and all was forgiven. Reebok claimed it was a design error and was not malicious, which to be fair given that they wrote Giblert Melendez, maybe they just messed the shirt up. Number 6. Jose Aldo Loves TRT Okay, I was just trying to be a bit funny with the entry title, but no, the dude was down with TRT usage. We here in the US who don't speak Portuguese often miss out on the thoughts of Jose Aldo, unless they are translated by someone awesome like Guilherme Cruz. Now, mind you, this was the peak of TRT Vitor's domination, and so the controversial therapy was a hot topic, and Aldo had a hot take saying, quote, I don't see the problem with using TRT. Everybody uses steroids, from the champion to the newcomer. I believe we from Nova Unyao are the only ones that don't do that. Randy Couture fought until he was 50, and you say he was clean? If the doctors prescribe you and you're on the limits, okay, I see no problem. If I need that one day, I will use TRT too. Well, somebody call the fire department and put the flames out from that take, even threw poor Randy under the bus in the middle of it. Number five, Rory's suspicions. How would you like me to taint your favorite fight ever? Would you like that because that's what I'm about to do? I will eat your heart, feast on your family, and then I will go to Disneyland. Whether it's the truth or not, Rory McDonald believes that Robbie Lawler was cheating during their epic all-time great showdown at UFC 189. When asked about the fight two years later during a Reddit AMA, in response to the question, do you think Robbie Lawler was on PEDs when you fought, Rory replied simply, I'm convinced he was. Also, he always typed on Reddit in all caps, so that wasn't for emphasis, just Rory being the Canadian psycho. When asked to clarify his position by MMA fighting, Rory further went on to explain that Robbie simply never let up no matter what during the fight, and he found that suspicious. This was not the first time he'd made such claims either. As a year after the bout, he had this to say on the MMA Hour. Some very interesting information that came about. We're gonna have to see where it goes, but it has something to do with that. My title fight with Robbie. Uh, I have to do my research, but uh, potentially a very big thing, and it pisses me right off. What Rory was referring to was an adverse finding in a pre-fight screening for Robbie Lawler before that bout, but it was apparently a marker that doesn't outright confirm a fail, but one that requires further tests, tests that came back clearing Robbie to fight. So while not a nothing burger, McDonald might have put a bit too much on the result and stirred up a controversy with his comments on the MMA hour and in the interviews since about the Hall of Fame fight. Considering one of the two people involved in such a huge event still thinks that the other guy was cheating, it's pretty wild this story is not that popular. Number four, TMZ's insane GSP story. The night that George St. Pierre very suddenly announced he'd be hanging up the gloves for a while after narrowly defending his welterweight title against Johnny Hendricks, a decision he said was related to his life outside the cage, speculation immediately began and was rampant about what it was that was so important to George that he would step away from the octagon. Well, we didn't have to wait but a day to hear the craziest shit possible. As TMZ claimed, a source told them George's father was dying and that he'd recently impregnated a woman who insisted on carrying the baby to term against his wishes. Well, all right then. I guess GSP does have a ton on his plate outside of fighting. Maybe that was why he was so shook up after the bout. But yeah, nope. Turns out, nope. George, as well as his sister, both confirmed that dad was a-okay. As for the rest of their claims. I'm not uh, a dad. I'm not in, in uh, rehab. My father is not dying. Bars. Well, there you go then. So what exactly was it that was bothering George at the time if it wasn't dying parents and unwanted babies? Dana White claimed that if what he had heard was the reason, that it was a very minor thing. The leading theory for many has been that it was a lawsuit he was involved in with his former manager over back pay, which sounds minor enough to fit the bill. Whatever it was, the outrageous TMZ story was never retracted and is still up on their website. Number three, Matt Mitrione's suspension. While the UFC touts itself as a bastion of free speech these days, they've not always been so lenient with their fighters in regards to what they say. In a 2013 interview with Ariel Helwani, Matt Mitrione would make disparaging comments about trans fighter Fallon Fox and see himself suspended by the UFC. Their statement read as such. The UFC is appalled by the transphobic comments made by heavyweight Matt Mitrione today in an interview on the MMA Hour. The organization finds Mr. Mitrione's comments offensive and wholly unacceptable, and as a direct result of this significant breach of the UFC's code of conduct, Mr. Mitrione's UFC contract has been suspended and the incident is being investigated. The UFC is a friend and ally of the LGBT community and expects and requires all 450 of its athletes to treat others with dignity and respect. He said some, some ignorant comments that made him sound like a complete jackass.
jackass and a bigot. Work at any company anywhere in the world and give your opinion where you come off sounding like an ignorant bigot. See how long you last at that company. Mitrione's suspension would be lifted later that year, and the UFC code of conduct would become more of a suggestion than a mandate as time went on. Number two, UFC SOPA support. The internet is a place where cowards live. You don't scare me. SOPA, or the Stop Online Piracy Act, if you don't recall, was a bill introduced in 2011 that would have been fantastic for the UFC in their fight against people pirating fights, but pretty much a massive disaster for everyone else, as well as for free speech on the internet. I really don't have time to get into all the reasons this attempt by the government to overregulate the internet was a terrible idea, but one of the key points was that any site that had any user-created content that was considered a copyright violation could be entirely shut down by the government and copyright holders. Real dystopian shit. And hacker activist groups like Anonymous were not fans, as you can imagine, nor were they happy about how vocally and publicly the UFC supported the bill. So they kept hacking their website and redirecting it to an anime drawing of a certain demonetizable German politician. The bill would rightly die despite the UFC's efforts to see it through to law. Number one, Holzerreich. Yeah, so MMA had a serious image problem in the early 2000s. And by image problem, I mean there were people who associated the sport with, let's just say, extreme racial ideologies. Such ideas were perpetuated by the likes of boxing promoter Bob Arum and boxing star Floyd Mayweather. And unfortunately, sometimes where there's smoke, there might be some fire. Clothing brand Holzerreich, whose designs seemed pretty obvious with their messaging, let's just put it that way, despite the owners consistently claiming otherwise, sparked controversy in 2009 when the brand who had been sponsoring fighters ended up on a tough finale as the walkout gear for Joe Brammer. Even in the wild times of the late 2000s, the gear stirred up a shitstorm, as MMA was still fighting for mainstream legitimacy. So a few weeks after the tough finale, the UFC outright banned the clothing brand from their shows as well as WEC events, prompting Holzer to pull a sponsor from one of the promotion's fighters named Donald Saron? I hope I'm saying that right. Almost immediately, Strike Force would follow the UFC's lead and ban the company from their shows as well, pretty much ending the brand's existence in the MMA space for any fighter serious enough to make it to a major promotion. But yeah, you don't hear too much about that chapter in the sport these days. I'll tell you what should never be swept under the rug though, the editor of this video, Luke Taylor. He does such a fantastic job. Please follow him on all his socials and go check out his awesome YouTube channel. A big, big, big thank you to our channel Hall of Famers. There they all are scrolling along. Your guys' support is awesome. And if you want to be as awesome as them, hit the join button. We got a new lower price. There's all kinds of exclusive content. Like and subscribe. If I surprised you with at least one of these stories today, let me know in the comments about other controversies nobody talks about anymore. And thank you so much for watching. Let's do this again real soon, shall we?